Um, our first speaker has an incredibly impressive bio that you can read on the website. Very impressive. He has accomplished a lot in a short time, and his work has really influenced the systems field widely. He is currently director of the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior, Department of Collective Behavior, and the chair of biodiversity and collective behavior at the University of Constance in Germany. Previously, he was a full professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Princeton University. Thankfully, not Harvard or hockey. <laughs> uh, so we'll forgive you, Ian, for that. Uh, <laughs> His, his work aims to reveal the fundamental principles that underlie evolved collective behavior, and co consequently, his research includes the study of a wide range of biological systems, from insect swarms to fish schools and primate groups. And in recognition of his research, he's been the recipient of several very impressive awards, which I will not take the time to read because it's too long of a list. But, but you can between you and I, some of the most impressive awards. Yes, very and impressive. His, his science is really some of my favorite. <laughs> yes. So you can read all of that uh, after the fact on the website. And on top of everything I've said, all that impressive stuff, I know it from, uh, from a good source that he's actually a really good guy and a nice person. So it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Ian Cousin. Take it away. Goodness. <laughs> Thanks very much. I don't know if I can, I can't live up to that. <laughs> um, it's, it, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so yeah, so um, it's wonderful to talk to an interdisciplinary audience because I think this is, this is one of the most important things that we can do in science is to really reach across boundaries and, and find ways to connect with each other. So I'm a biologist, so I'll mostly talk about biology today, but hopefully this will also reach out into other aspects of interest. Uh, so we've spent a lot of time, us, us humans, in our scientific research and trying to understand the individual brain. Uh, but much less work, until quite recently, has looked at how social interactions, these sort of invisible forces between us, uh, connect brains together to give rise to collective intelligence or higher order properties. And so I'm really fascinated by the connection between or the relationship between individual and collective computation. And that's what the focus of today's talk will be about. Now, when we look in the natural world, collective behavior, so this is the, uh, the focus of our work, you know, how these uh, interconnections give rise to high order properties is not just among brained organisms, but even if we think of the origins of multicellularity, the origins of complex life on the planet, this must have involved understanding, you know, collective dynamics. And so we've literally studied the, the simplest animal on the planet. It's called Placozoa. It's in its own phylum. It's arguably the most primitive metazoan on the planet. And it has no neurons, even though it's got the full complement of neurotransmitters. These evolved before neurons. And if we look at the density, you can see here the, the density of the cells or the orientation of the cells here coded by color. It looks a little bit like a fish school or a bird flock where local interactions, local alignment of individuals leads to patterns that can extend across the whole organism. And indeed in this work, we were able to show that this local self-organization process, even if it's finely tuned, really leads to fundamental limitations of how large these organisms can grow. And so you need to have this differentiation and the emergence of neuronal control for more complex body organizations. Elsewhere in the natural world, we study the most arguably, the most complex animal on our planet. These are humans. And here we were studying humans in the context of threats within the crowd, because people are very good at detecting threats, but unlikely to actually respond, so-called bystander apathy. So here we wondered whether we could use computer vision techniques to infer where dangerous or risky behavior was occurring within crowds. Because what we discovered is that, uh, again, local interactions and local copying behavior, for example, copying of the gaze of others, leads to these waves percolating through the system. And I started my research in collective behavior looking at social insects. Here you can see army ants. This is literally blind ants, the blind leading the blind, forming a bridge out of their living bodies. This is a time lapse. 
allowing the other ants to traverse increasingly large gaps, or on the right, forming scaffolding uh, to allow their other members of the colony to easily transport food and not lose it. But when we look at these types of collective organizations, these animals are highly related to one another. They're more related to their sisters than they would be to their own offspring through a, a strange genetic quirk. And so really we can think of selection operating at the level of the colony for the fitness of the colony. But most often in the natural world, when we have groups of animals, we're actually dealing with genetically selfish individuals, such as schooling fish. And this also highlights another technology we've developed, because it's very hard to ask a fish, how much energy are you using when schooling? But in a robot, we can look at the different possible strategies fish could employ when schooling and actually discover via robotics the optimal behaviors that individuals are used. And then we can test our theory versus directly versus experiments with the real organisms. Another technology that's really revolutionizing all of this research is deep learning or AI. Um, and we've also developed new technologies that allow us to track hundreds of animals simultaneously. And what's remarkable about this is that these deep neural networks can be trained to identify individuals, even though no human could see the difference, for example, between these termites or these locusts. It also highlights the fact that the same software is species agnostic. It can identify these mice, even though, again, a human can't. And even all of these Drosophila, it knows the unique identities. And all of the software we develop is free and open source, and we're constantly improving it. And this allows us to look at this contagion of behavior through collectives. This is the hallmark of collective behavior, how the change of behavior of one or a few individuals can be transmitted to others. And there's lots of very interesting properties that differentiate social contagion, which is a so-called complex contagion, from simple contagions like disease. One way that we are studying these systems is not just tracking the individuals, but reconstructing their sensory information. So here near the bottom, near the center, there's a focal individual where we're reconstructing the left visual field in red, and the right visual field in blue. And so we're casting the rays of photons onto the retina of the individual so we can reconstruct the world it sees. And you can see from these data that this is a complex time varying scene, both due to the motion of the focal individual, but also to the motion of others. So even simple vertebrates like fish, like all animals, the brain has evolved to take in high order complex sensory information and to reduce that down to low level decisions. And using these methods and these approaches in machine learning, which again, the details don't matter too much. Um, I, I just want to give you an overall picture today by reconstructing these visual fields and working out which features, which visual features they're paying attention to. We can do something that's very helpful because if you're interested in how the individual brain works, you can go into the brain and use microscopy to look at the physical and functional connectivity and interactions. But when we deal with collective behavior, the interactions among individuals have no physical form. And so we need to use these new technologies to visualize the invisible, revealing these hidden networks of interaction. And the networks I show here are not based on things like distance and so on. They're not good proxies for information flow. They're really based on the visual information and how the individuals are known to utilize it. And if we zoom in on these networks, we can see that they're weighted and they're directed. That is, weight means a strong connection and directedness means, for example, in many social systems they're directed, I could be strongly influenced by you, but you not by me. So there could be an arrow towards me, but not away from me. And we find this within uh, these types of groups and using our understanding of how the information flows, we achieved a very predictive understanding of at least for these simple vertebrates, how behavior propagates. And this is a real fish school throwing this network of communication. And this is not a, a small world network or a scale-free network. It's in its own class of network under strong selection pressure for millennia. And I think we can learn a lot by understanding the unique properties of such evolved networks. And to give you an example, 
of some of the things that we've discovered, just a summary, we often think of, as I said at the beginning, the brain is the seat of information processing. But in addition to that, we find that the network of communication and modulating that network of communication allows information to be processed external of the brain by the collective. In the context, for example, of regulating social contagion, how behavior spreads through the system, modulating behavior in response to increased risk. So if the world around you gets more risky, as you can imagine, for an individual in isolation, it gets more jittery and it's more sensitive to information coming in. It's more sensitive to input. It's more likely to make false alarms due to that sensitivity. However, doing the same experiment of individuals in a collective, we find they become less sensitive to input from the environment. But what they do is they change the topology of the network of communication, making stronger network connections with others. So each individual becomes less responsive, but if an individual does respond, that reduces the false alarm rate. If an individual does respond, it can allow the information to flow through the collective. So we can't think of how individuals adjust their they're tuning to the statistics of the environment without thinking about this network of communication. We've also shown that individuals in these groups cannot sense long range environmental gradients at the individual level, but via network properties collectively, they can do so and, and sense very long range gradients. Now, this might sound a little bit like what, what some people would call group selection. You know, the group is able to perform some sort of cognitive tasks. And I mentioned earlier on that these are genetically selfish individuals. Well, it turns out in other work we've done, we've been able to show that such emergent collective properties readily evolve among genetically selfish individuals. So there is no conflict with Darwinian selection here at all. Um, and yet it brings to mind many of the types of computations we think about within our brain and within neural systems, where changing the topology and the strength of connections is what gives rise to the remarkable properties uh, and collective intelligence within the brain. So I think there's very good reason for us to talk more about spatiotemporal or computation across natural systems. And that will really be the focus of what I will now talk about. And so I'm gonna discuss some pretty old work first, but only because it sets the scene for some very recent work. And I'm showing you these beautiful pictures of fish from Matt McHenry, but I'll show you later data from primates and, and other animals that, you know, these, you can think of cells, you can even to some degree think of humans in this framework. We've done experiments with humans using this framework. So how do animals within these groups make decisions? And how does leadership emerge? And how does information flow through the system? So say the individual with this red vector, it knows to go a certain migration route because it's got experience that the others don't have. Or perhaps it's seen some food over there the others haven't seen. How does it convey that? Does it need to signal to others? I know what's going on, follow me. Well, we've got no evidence of that. Do others need to recognize each other to understand who has information, who, who is, uh, salient information at any moment in time. Again, we don't have evidence of that. So if we think about this from a computational perspective, the simplest type of model is that these individuals have some sort of internal vector representation of their goal. And at the time I did these works, this was uh, speculation. Uh, later on, I'll show you, we now have neural data that shows that's indeed the case. Um, and also vectors that point towards their social, uh, social individuals. And by weighting these two terms, their social vectors and their goal-oriented vector, they can trade off these different social tendencies or social and internal tendencies. And here you can see um, 100 individuals where the white individuals are the informed individuals. Now, importantly, the colors are just so we can see who's informed and who's not, just us humans can see. The green cross just shows you the centroid or center of gravity in the group. The individuals start at random positions and random orientations, and there's no way of inferring the state or you can't read the mind of the other individuals. And the individuals with this preferred direction of travel have a shared common direction of travel along the x-axis. And what we can show is that without signaling and without individual recognition, the information can readily be conveyed across the collective. 
Now, in this case, all of these informed individuals were in agreement. But just as in human societies, in these groups, they live in what are called fission fusion populations. They're merging and splitting regularly. And so it's likely that they don't know the informational status of others in the group. And it's also likely that there could be conflicts within the group. Some individuals wanting to go one way and others wanting to go in a different direction. Can they come to a collective consensus to decide where to go? Now we can do this. I can ask you for your votes and I could count them and pass you back the majority decision. But how can animals do this? They don't have a capacity to count. They only have these noisy, simple, local interactions. So is this a lost cause or can they perform this type of computation? And so it turns out that what's important are the number of individuals with preferences, the strength of those preferences, which I'll come back to, but also the fact that all animals at some point in their lives are making decisions on the move. They're moving through geometric space. And so here I'm going to show you the results from many thousands of simulations in which one subset of individuals, five individuals in this case in a group of 100, always want to go along that lower dotted line. That represents zero degrees along the x-axis. The upper dotted line represents the disagreement of the other group. On the left-hand side, this could be small, like 10, 20, or 30 degrees, where they want to go in a similar direction. On the right-hand side, we have 180 degrees, where they want to go in exactly opposite directions. And if they were somehow miraculously able to count votes and do a perfect mathematical calculation of the average preference, they would fall along that solid line. So let's see what happens. Below a critical difference of opinion, below a critical angle, even though they can't count, even though no one knows the informational the desires of anyone else, you don't know if anyone agrees with you or disagrees with you, they will very accurately find the average victorial preference. Now, if you imagine they're going towards a red target to the left and a green target to the right, as you're moving through space and approaching those targets, this angle will slowly increase. And what the model predicts is when you reach a critical angle, suddenly, instead of averaging, we have a winner-takes-all dynamic, where half of the time, one group wins out and the entire group goes that way. This is not the group splitting. And half of the time, the entire group makes the opposite decision and goes in the opposite direction. So they suddenly transition from averaging to this consensus decision-making based on the geometry as they're moving through space. And a tiny difference of geometry causes an abrupt transition in the collective dynamics. Now, here we can see, in this case, 10 individuals want to go to the white target, 10 to the red, they started at random positions and orientations. And here they're gonna choose the red, but they equally could have chosen the white. Now, what if I add just one extra individual so 1% of total group size. Again, no one knows if anyone agrees with them or disagrees with them. You don't know if you're in the majority or not. Um, and you start at random positions and random orientations. So now in a group of 100, we have six that want to go one way versus five that want to go another. And these are stochastic models. These are noisy individuals with local, simple rules. And yet, as we saw before, below that critical angular difference, they will spontaneously go in the average direction thus increasing the angle between the options to the critical point, where now 95% of the time or more, they will collectively select the majority, even though the majority is tiny, and even though no one can count. And here you can see a simulation where there's just one extra white individual in the group, and you can see the local noisy nature of the interactions, yet almost always they will select the majority. So when you see a fish school or a bird flock, they really are kind of like a fluid computer going through space. Their local rules can allow them to compute things about their world that no individual is aware of. Now you can enter a regime if individuals are really intransigent and unwilling to give up on their preferences where they will split, but most of the time they will stay together. Now, when I wrote that paper, I was kind of you know, amazed that, you know, that they could do this, they could, they could make this really um, fine computation 
despite all of those dumb, uninformed individuals. And it was only later in this work that I realized it's not despite the uninformed individuals, it's because of the uninformed individuals. And in this work, we, we initially started with models of blocking and schooling and showed that actually having a small proportion, say 15% of uninformed individuals in the decision-making process prevents an extremist minority from dominating group decisions and returns control to the numerical majority, i.e. it democratizes decisions. And we could show this also experimentally on the right. But what we also did was I started getting interested in whether these are general principles going beyond fish schools and bird flocks. And so we also did models of human social systems, two models um, that are in detail, detailed in the supplement. Um, and we also found the same result. And humans often exclude uninformed individuals or individuals without strong preferences from decisions. And this argues actually they act as a sort of social glue that allows differing opinions to actually communicate more effectively uh, to prevent sort of fragmentation or polarization. And we also find that they can make, allow groups to make uh, smarter and faster decisions. And so when we think about collective minds, I hinted earlier that there might be some fundamental principles in common across nature. And you know, back in 2007, when I wrote this, I was very cautious because surely not, surely neurons are, I mean, the level of selection is different. They're wildly different in terms of cognitive capacities. Surely this is just an analogy. There can't really be something fundamental uh, in, in common about collective computation among neurons and among animals. Um, and I think I was wrong. And what I'd like to show you today in, in the next part of the talk, which is uh, either new or unpublished work, is that I think there are fundamental principles of spatiotemporal computation that extend beyond and connect widely or wildly different systems. So connecting collective decision-making among organisms and that among neural collectives. And, and some of this, of course, is very new and, and, and speculative, but I will uh, present this, um, what we've done so far. And so I became interested in how do neural collectives, how do individual brains make decisions when moving through space? And all animals at some point have to move through space and do so. And there's been a remarkable body of work, especially in the last five to 10 years, um, looking at uh, what are called model organisms like Drosophila or zebrafish, uh, and also some uh, mammal models like mice, rats, and uh, even some primates like this rhesus macaque. And they've looked at how the brain is making decisions, sometimes in space, but mostly just looking at how the brain is making decisions. And when it comes to spatial decision-making, it has been shown in all of these systems that the brain is explicitly representing vectorial information. So this is these, these vectors here in that top picture. This is a, a fly brain. This neural bump, this bump of neural activity, this glowing region, that's neurons that are active, is actually literally encoding on this torus, on this donut-like shape, is literally encoding the direction of travel of the animal, where the animal wants to go. If we look in the mammalian brain, there isn't, to our knowledge, a literal torus, but there's a, a functional connectivity that acts like a torus, that, for example, uh, the brain comes to a consensus regarding which direction the head is looking at. And there's even some remarkable work by Nafko Malinovsky that really shows this vectorial representation of spatial goals, including the direction of other bats are encoded as we predicted as vectors within the brain. And so this uh, was very exciting to me when these works came out in, in sort of 2017 and, and just after, because this is how I'd been thinking about integration of information, about integration of vectors. And one nice thing about the brain is it's easier to train a single animal than to train a collective. And you know, the fish schools will split apart and so on. So maybe we can also use our understanding of collective decision-making to understand the individual decisions within the collective. But it's gonna be kind of difficult to do this. As you saw before with those bifurcation plots, remember when I had five versus five, there was an equal probability of going each way, but just one extra individual broke that symmetry and the whole group went in the majority direction. This suggests that there's a, a great sensitivity to these decision-making uh, aspects, which is indeed exactly why I'm interested in them, because that's a great thing for the brain to do. But if that is true, 
if it does relate to how the brain works, this type of behavior, then it's gonna be very hard to see in a conventional lab because there can be electrical gradients or light gradients or wind currents that I as a human cannot detect, but animals could, that breaks the symmetry and means that I don't see the bifurcations in the brain of the animals. So I need to have a world where I have complete control. And the way we do that is to put animals into immersive, like freely moving animals into immersive holographic virtual reality. And so it's actually based on a kind of old illusion. And I can tell you right now, this is an illusion. This tape does not have a volume above the table. And even if I tell you it's an illusion, your brain still believes it to be volumetric, even though it's not. And here you'll see the illusion is broken. And even if the tape, even if the picture goes roughly into the right position, your brain will pop it back into 3D. And so if this type of illusion can fool uh, a human, then surely we can also use it to fool animals. And so what you can do is by tracking the eyes of the animal, it can move in behind and fully interact with arbitrary complex virtual scenes. And that's exactly what we developed in this work. We developed virtual reality systems for a wide range of species from flies to fish to mice. Here, I'll just show you some of the work we've been doing with uh, flies, locusts, and fish. So the system tracks the animal at 100 times per second, calculates the positions of the eyes, and then can project the world such that this pillar, it looks weird to us on the left there, but is always projected just like that tape and the shoe to appear to be in the tank with the animal. And this is sped up, this is uh, slightly sped up, but you can see the fish will avoid it, avoid the pillar, even though there's nothing there, there's just light. Similarly, we can create virtual fish. So now we can have virtual fish within the tank interacting in real time with real fish. So here the virtual fish is just performing a simple circular maneuver with an orange trajectory, but you can see the real fish with the red trajectory believes it to be in the tank with it, even though of course we're only projecting onto the surface of the tank using this anamorphic illusion updated as I mentioned 100 times per second. Now here are our virtual reality systems here in Constance for the fish. And there's a problem here because I can't put more than one individual into any of these tanks. So I can make as many virtual individuals as possible, but I can only ever have one real individual. Because if I put a second real individual into the tank, remember when the paper was moved slightly, the illusion was broken? The illusion only works precisely from the perspective of one individual, i.e. it will be broken for the other. But what we can and do is we can network these systems together such that the individual in the nearmost tank interacts in real time with a hologram of the individual in the second tank and vice versa, or the third or the fourth, when I'm building 15 of these tanks. So here we can see two zebrafish that are interacting, not in the same physical world, but in the same holographic world. And due to the movie, we call this the matrix. It's a similar principle. And the great thing about the holographic world is we control physics, we control time, we control space, so we can really understand how the brain works. But importantly, work by postdoc and now group leader, Liang Li, has shown if you look at the detailed turning speeds or forward speeds of the fish, how they respond to each other in great detail, it's absolutely identical when two fish are interacting in the holographic world than when the same fish are interacting in the physical world. The data in the matrix is even better, even cleaner, because sometimes when animals get too close in the real world, the tracking system loses one of them. In the virtual world, that never happens. So we can be sure that they're not just interacting with each other, they really believe the holograms to be another individual. And here you're seeing four individuals interacting within the matrix. And of course, we can have as many uh, uh, computer controlled virtual animals in the loop as we want. And so this allows us, like in, in neuroscience, people have created what's called the dynamical patch clamp, where you can have your algorithm that's trying to understand the neural circuit interacting live with the circuit. Well, here we can have our algorithms that are understanding social behavior interacting live with real animals in a sort of social, dynamical social patch clamp. We also work with fruit flies because their brain uh, is, is very well 
understood in virtual reality and plague forming locusts that these are desert locusts that impact the livelihood of one in 10 people on the planet through food shortage and here the animal moves on a motion compensating ball so it can be in an infinite environment this checkered board is just to calibrate it um, so we can look at locust collective behavior too and we can also record from the neurons to understand how the brain makes decisions within the virtual reality environment so there's lots of advantages we've got the control over the sensory inputs employed by individuals. I should mention that our zebrafish are tiny, they're less than a centimeter long, and so they cannot use the lateral line or other cues, they only use vision. We can quantify into individual differences. We can also connect the theory to experiments in very powerful ways to do full parametric scans that you could never do in conventional experiments. And finally, we can control causality because one of the biggest problems in collective behavior is if I'm influencing you and you're influencing me and that's a dynamic relationship, that's even hard to understand. What if there's a third individual? Are they influencing me directly or via interacting with you or both? What about a fourth and a fifth? Here we can actually control these networks of communication. So coming back to this question I want to address, how the brain makes decisions when moving through space. This work, uh, the fly experiments and the, um, the numerical models were done with my PhD student Vivek Sridhar, who's recently graduated. Liang Li, who I mentioned before, did the fish experiments in VR. Dan Gorbanos, who's a black hole physicist, did the analytic theory. Bianca Schell, an undergraduate, did the locust experiments. And my long-term collaborator, Nia Gov at the Weizmann Institute, helped us with the analytic work and conceptual work and generally was involved in everything. And I won't go into the details of the model today because actually the details really do not matter. This, the results are incredibly robust. But all brains have this general feature where there's reinforcement or positive feedback among neural ensembles that have similar directional preferences or similar preferences. And there can then be competition or inhibition between neural groups that differ in their preferences. In our case, we're dealing with vectorial representations, but this is a general feature of the brain regarding all types of decisions. But in the context of this ring, um, either this physical ring in the fly brain or the functional ring in the mammalian brain, we, this is termed a neural ring attractor network. Um, and so by understanding how the consensus is made and how this vector is decided upon, we hope to understand something fundamental about animal decisions on the move. And all animals, as I mentioned, you know, have to decide where to go, whether you're a, a primate or whether you're a locust. And so we're asking, is there a common algorithm? And so we developed this model of the brain. And it turned out that it makes specific predictions that I'll go into details about in a moment. For example, when deciding between two equal options, we find that the animals will tend to move in the average direction until a critical point, at which case the brain suddenly transitions to decide. Now, this is literally a bifurcation in physical space, but it's also a bifurcation in dynamical systems theory in the brain. So the brain is suddenly undergoing what's called a phase transition or a phase-like transition. Um, and so if we look at uh, analytic model, so we can prove this result. You can see the fly on the left there, if it's far away from the targets, the brain has to average those options. There's no dynamical solution that's alternative. As the fly moves from the left to the right, the egocentric angle between the options gets larger and larger as it approaches the targets. And when it hits the black line, we can prove the brain has to switch to a decision-making mode. And the gray zone there is what's called a hysteresis regime. And the neural noise of the systems we've studied are all point two. So we are in the gray region. And what happens there is that anywhere in one of those angles, the brain can flip to a decision, but the hysteresis means it doesn't flip back to indecision. So once a brain makes a decision, it's extremely unlikely to flip back to indecision. And so what this means is in the, in the simulation, um, you can get this very clear critical point, but in reality, we'd expect animals to make this bifurcation across a range of different angles. But nonetheless, we should be able to see this in trajectory space. The animal's approaching a critical point, the brain undergoing this critical transition, and then the decision being made. Now, I was kind of amazed that people hadn't looked at this before. 
And it turns out that we couldn't find a single paper in the literature where anyone had looked at the trajectory of an animal as it makes a decision. It's almost as if people think of the, the movement as the outcome, like the animal looks at the options, makes a decision, and just moves to facilitate that decision. Our theory is different. Our theory is what's called an embodied process, whereby the animal, the sensory information comes in, this causes collective dynamics on the neural ring attractor and a, a neural consensus, which changes the animal movement. But because the animal's moving in space, this changes the sensory representation, which changes the movement, which changes the sensory representation via a recursive feedback. So that's the fundamental difference to previous theories. And as I mentioned, there's no data that we could find, not one paper where people are just asked how do animals move when they're choosing. And so we did experiments first with fruit flies, and you can clearly see this bifurcation. So X and Y is just the physical space over four meters uh, in virtual reality, the fly flying towards two options and then bifurcating as it goes towards leftmost or the rightmost. So we show the spectral plot, which is the average of all the trajectories. Similarly with the locusts, clear evidence as the animal moves through space that the brain does exhibit the bifurcation as we predicted. Now this is kind of cool, but why is this important? Well, firstly, it can tell us something about how animals move in space, which I think is important and interesting, but it also potentially tells us why the brain operates like this. Because there's a universal property of any collective system undergoing a phase transition or phase-like transition. And this is genuinely a universal property um, from physical systems to financial systems, to ecosystems, to neural systems. A property called susceptibility can provably peak close to the critical point. Now, what is susceptibility? It was discovered in ferrous magnetic systems. But what it means in all of these systems is there's an ultra sensitivity of the system close to the critical point that ultra sensitivity to any external inputs. In the case of the ferrous magnet, external magnetic fields. In the case of an ecosystem, anthropogenic change, for example, could cause a major transition to an ecosystem if it's close to a critical transition. In the case of neural dynamics, then in a noisy little fly brain with all this noise and all this environmental noise, suddenly close to the critical point as an emergent property that we do not put into the model, the brain becomes like a supercomputer and incredibly uh, remarkably capable of distinguishing any differences between the options only at that point. And as it zips past that point, suddenly the brain becomes kind of dumb again. And importantly, this is a true emergent property and a provable emergent property of these systems. And it doesn't matter the angle at which the animal comes into the decision. There's this uh, manifold, this curve at which the brain must undergo this critical transition. And what a wonderful thing for a decision-making system to have for free an emergent hypersensitivity or ultra-sensitivity. And so if we think about the principles of decision-making that we know about, we know that the perceived difference between options is important. If you can easily see the difference between options, decisions are easy to make. If it's hard to see the uh, difference between options, you can take more time to integrate information. Controlling for these, these are both true, Controlling for these, we argue that this is a third general property of decisions, geometry. And who would have thought if you have two options with the top one slightly better than the other one, that it would matter if you place the individual in between the options or at the same distance, but to the side. You wouldn't have predicted that or thought to even do the experiment, which is why it's so important to do theory. And so we tested this uh, with our locusts in these two configurations. And this work was done by undergraduate Lisa Ecker as our undergraduate thesis. And we made the decision difficult. And indeed locusts beyond the bifurcations, the brain cannot go through this bifurcation, find it tremendously difficult. They slightly went to the preferred option, slightly more than average. But at the same distance with the same options, if the brain is allowed to go through the bifurcation, we predicted it should improve decision-making by 35%, and in fact, perhaps even greater than that is what we found. It massively amplifies the difference, again, as predicted by the theory. What about three options? Because believe it or not, animals don't live in worlds just with binary decisions. 
The theory spontaneously predicts now the brain should exhibit multiple bifurcations to reduce the complexity of the world down to a series of binary decisions. Again, this was an emergent property that we did not expect to find in the model. We now understand it, um, but at the time, this was a great surprise to us. And so to test this, we need an order of magnitude more data because uh, it's just harder. The more targets we add, the more and more data we need. And if we're correct, the brain spontaneously breaks the world down, deals with complexity by breaking the world down into a series of binary decisions. And close to each critical bifurcation, the brain becomes extremely sensitive to any differences among the remaining options. So we'll exclude one option to the left or the right, and then a second option. And so we conducted these experiments with our flies and with our locusts. And indeed, we found strong evidence of the double bifurcation as predicted by our theory. And I should emphasize, not by other theories. And the, the model works in three-dimensional space, and it also scales to any number of options. Most cognitive models don't scale very well, which is why most people just do two options. And here you can see them moving from a center point uh, to many, many different options. Um, and I, I'm just including this because I, I find these um, I find these patterns genuinely very beautiful. And this paper came out in December, so it's got a sort of snowflake theme to it as well. And so if I'm arguing that this is a general principle, and I've looked at flies and locusts as my two experimental systems, those are both evolutionarily divergent, but they're both insects. Now, if it's truly uh, predictive, it should also apply to the vertebrate brain, a completely different brain. And not only that, we should take, be able to take the same model with the same two parameters that have evolved in the flies and the locusts and apply it directly to the zebra. It's not changing a thing. And that's exactly what we did. Um, and now we change the ecological context. So now we look at schooling behavior because locusts aren't just attracted to static objects like flies and locusts are. So here we have two virtual fish here shown in red, just so you can see them. And the real fish will tend to follow them behind. And our theory predicts as we change the distance between the options that will change the angle and the brain should exhibit a bifurcation. And that's exactly what we find experimentally. Similarly, with three individuals, we should expect to see a double bifurcation. Now this double bifurcation looks different than before because of the moving frame of reference. But again, you know, as a biologist, we wouldn't even know what experiments to conduct. And even if we were to conduct experiments with a wacky looking graph like that, how on earth would we understand it? So that's the importance of linking experiments and theory. And also in the virtual reality, we can precisely explore this parameter space. I can't train fish to swim precisely at certain distances apart. So the VR was critical to show that indeed the fish does have this double bifurcation. And there's lots more um, tests of this theory in the paper. But again, I want to emphasize that we think this is a very powerful theory and it's very robust. I didn't need to tweak things. I don't, you know, I can use a very generic model. Well, that means we should then be able to make predictions about what's going on in the brains of other animals, including, for example, wild primates. So we put GPS collars on almost all of the adults in this baboon troop, but we did not put on juveniles for ethical reasons. And all the collars were removed at the end of the experiment. And each second in their lives, we now have the location of the individuals within the group. The colors show males, females, and subadults. Um, it turns out that none of that matters. They have a linear dominance hierarchy. If you look at the, the BBC or whatever, they always say that the dominant male tells everyone what to do. No, not at all. It's a democratic consensus. But here you can see them giving up on one option and choosing the other. And so we could actually test this dynamical systems theory, this bifurcation, or if you have equal options with different angles, and if you then break the symmetry in the wild primate brain with an individual looking at one or two individuals moving in different directions or with an asymmetry that breaks this. So just as we predicted, uh, we could also find evidence for this theory in wild primate brains. So in the last couple of minutes, I just want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing here in Constance in the Center for the Advanced Study of Collective Behavior. We just moved into this new building last year Currently, um, you know, biologists are still in the biology department, physicists in physics, chemistry, you know, and so on. And really, we really wanted to test this systems thinking by actually having a vast number of disciplines working on collective dynamics and collective behavior from cells to 
human societies working and researching together in the same offices, the same labs, um, to really create this interdisciplinary community. And it also doesn't harm the fact that we live on Lake Constance overlooking the Alps. This I just took uh, with my phone from, from uh, over the window. And it's a beautiful place. And so please, we have money for visiting people to come and spend time with us. We want our community to really be enriched and to enrich the global community. Uh, and also most biology experiments are conducted over the scale of say a meter or a meter and a half. Well, animals don't move over a meter or a meter and a half. And as soon as you release animals into bigger spaces, you release natural behaviors. So this is our imaging hangar in the same building, which is 15 by 15 by eight meters. And we can track at 500 Hertz, even a Drosophila in this space uh, at submillimeter spatial precision in 3D. Um, we've done experiments with rats, Lo and behold, people, uh, it's a classic animal for solving mazes. But you know, you ask the experts, well, what happens if you put two rats in the maze? Oh, never done that. And so we looked at what happens when you put groups of rats. And of course, they have these beautiful algorithms based on contact and sight and smell that they use to collectively solve problems because they're highly social. Most animals that us humans study, like rats and zebrafish and zebra finches and, uh, and, and so on, they're, they're all highly social, pigeons. Um, and working with Ahmed Al Hadi, who just started as a group leader, uh, recruited from Princeton, started here last week. Uh, we're also doing non-invasive neural imaging of rats making decisions over naturalistic scales. Um, we also have a paper in revision where we've used this to track starlings in flocks, also being able to look at acoustic communication. And again, we want this to be available to the whole community. And then a few weeks ago, or maybe a month and a bit ago, we did experiments with 10,000 locusts in a swarm in this, in this space. Again, with real-time tracking, submillimeter precision of these swarms. And here you can see a, a five meter arena with 10,000 locusts. And it's the first time ever in a laboratory condition, we've been able to regenerate what's called a hopper band, this band formation, this marching band, which is a hallmark of these devastating swarms. And we also had the pleasure of working with a YouTuber called Tom Scott. I'd never heard of him, but my kids were very excited. And he turned out to be an awesome chap, a British YouTuber who came and, and filmed this. So if you're interested, he has a video that came out maybe two weeks ago, and it got 2.1 million views in one week um, about the work we're doing. And so we're trying to, we haven't analyzed this. We, we are trying to do the science in the public eye. We're going to make the data publicly available as we get it. And we're going to update all the scripts and all the, I, I hate this idea of science being done behind closed doors and people being scared of being scooped and so on. We want to have the whole process in the open and make the data available because other people are going to come up with better ideas than us or, or complementary ideas to us. So we want to sort of, again, really make a statement here that we are um, making science accessible to everybody. Uh, we've also used the same facility uh, in, in CVPR, which is a, a prestigious computer science journal, so publishing in different areas where we can train uh, 3D neural networks to, to track um, animals such as pigeons, they're both in the field and in the lab. And this is very using very cheap technology. We use very expensive technology to train networks to do things on the cheap to make it available to anyone around the world. And again, using off the shelf drones, we also study animals in nature here in Kenya. Now, why do we use drones to study these animals? Well, these are zebra. Surely you could just get these types of trajectories by putting collars on the animals. Well, that means you have to dart them and tranquilize them. You need a big team of individuals. And that's very problematic when there's only 2,000 left in the world, adults left. You won't get permission and it's not ethical to do so. Furthermore, this is, time, this is sped up. You can see the little waggy tails. When we use drones, we can identify them from the drones and we can even now track the ears which is very important for equids looking at emotional state. We can get much more rich behavioral data from these systems. And it's precisely the systems we can't get permission to put tags on that we need to understand why they're so vulnerable to human presence. Similarly, we're studying an ancient lineage of wolves in India using the same technology to track the wolves. And if we zoom in on an individual, you can see the rich behavior that we can get from these technologies and we can identify them based on coat patterns. And a couple of weeks ago, I came back from the Maldives, where we were studying vast schools of fish against these beautiful coral sand backgrounds. And this is our team. It was a tough field season, sitting on the boat using the drone in the Maldives. It was amazing. Um, and this is what we were studying, black tip reef sharks hunting. 
never been studied before. Um, and here you can see an individual trying to isolate this within the school. And using these new tracking technologies, we can track the movement of these sharks and look at their decision making. And in fact, they are highly collective as well, super smart animals. Here you can see groups of sharks hunting together within this school of fish. And of course, we're also tracking the fish. And if we zoom out, we also have the 3D structure of the environment. So we can put the data back into this, uh, into the, the, the environment in which it evolved. And here you're seeing time-lapse footage. And in each of these vacuoles, there's a, a black tip brief shark. I'm sorry about the resolution. I created this for Twitter. I need to create a higher resolution version. But you can see these waves, uh, the sort of sensitivity of this fish school as a system and all of these sharks uh, interacting uh, hunting together within these groups. And using this multi-scale approach, we want to understand the system properties. And thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Ian. That was fantastic. Uh, great, a great talk. Um, and, and we're getting lots of Q&A to say the same. Um, <clears throat> you can hear me, yes? Yes, I can. Yes. Can you still hear me? Yep. So I, I first want to say that I, I love your work. I've loved your work for years. Uh, that's not something I say lightly. I've, I've followed your work since we met at Cornell uh, when I was a, in grad school. And I, it, you might remember we, we were, I think, playing drinking games and talking nonlinear dynamics and trying to decide on a name for my son who was about yeah. to be born. And um, also, I, I, stu I stupidly left my cell phone on the table when I went to the bar. And when I got back, I had a Twitter account. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. Um, one of the things that has interested me immensely and kind of tickles my brain uh, is, is the idea that simple local rules are leading to these complex emergent properties. And, and this is often counter, counterintuitive for a lot of people in the world um, because complexity is not really considered related to simplicity, right? That the, to most people in the world, those two ideas yeah. seem to conflict. And even dumb individuals isn't related to smart collective behavior, right? Those things seem to conflict. Can you speak more to, to the general audience? Because I think this is something yeah. that people really need to understand. And, and one of the main reasons that I wanted you know, more, I, yeah, it's great to hear that your work got so many views. And I, I really think your work needs to be heard about to the general public. Um, so talk a little bit about why that is. Why, why is simplicity and complexity, which seems counterintuitive, so related? Yeah, I think it's, it's a, thanks for your kind words. And it's, yeah, it's a wonderful point. Um, so um, if we think about um, the physical world, if we think about the you know um, intermolecular interactions, there's a vast suite of molecules. There's an almost infinite number of potential interactions between groups of atoms. Um, and so you think, my God, if we can hardly understand how protein folds or how atoms connect, then how on earth would we be able to understand collectives, large collectives of these systems? But yet when we look around us, um, we find fundamental states of matter, liquid, solid, gas, and plasma, unless you really play around with temperature and, and pressure. And so there's a hidden simplicity and there are shared collective properties among these different systems. We know what a solid is. This table's got different properties to this glass, but they're both, I mean, to the first approximation, solid. And so I think um, one of the, the great surprises, I think, is, is biologists in particular are obsessed with details. But no matter how much you study an individual ant, you could look at that ant and you could have thousands of people study that individual ant. It wouldn't be possible to predict what those ants do together in a colony. So firstly, that type of approach doesn't make sense. And also we don't need to model every atom or every subatomic particle to model higher order systems. And so um, what complexity science teaches us is that there are certain properties that really matter um, and there are others that don't necessarily matter. So, I mean, our model is not a perfect model of the fly brain or the fish brain or the primate brain, but it can be applied across those different systems because of this low dimensional collective behavior. And natural selection should be expected to find such robust behavior for something as fundamental as navigation, for example. And so I think 
if it, it's not mutually exclusive, like you could put a very complicated model with all the neurons and so on. And if you want to do an optogenetic manipulation, maybe that's important. But neuroscientists are always surprised. They put all the stuff in and it just behaves like a, a low dimensional ring attractor model. And so I think this is just one example of where or humans in a crowd become incredibly predictable, but each individual human is not predictable. You know, there is a hidden simplicity in certain collective dynamics and collective behaviors. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks. Um, we, we have time for one more question. Uh, and, and I will say your papers and research, you know, is excellent and readily available online, like you said. So for those of you who want to read uh, about the science behind all of this, the, you know, please go see Ian's papers and we'll post some of those under the video and stuff. But while we have you here um, in a wide range of audience and experts and scientists, as well as practitioners and novices, um, I'm wondering how Ian, the scientist, sees the world as you're walking around as Ian the human with, you know, when you're going to a football <laughs> game or Ian, you know, you're going, you're with your kids. What are some of the takeaways that, that, um, that you take from your research that you apply when you're, when you're just in regular life? Uh, what, what do you notice that maybe other people might not notice? Yeah, well, so, some of them are sort of what my, what my nine-year-old son would call life hacks. Um, which, uh, you know, I'm pretty good at getting on a train on a crowded subway because I know how the crowd on average statistically will move towards the doors and so on. And oh, similarly, I, I can get through crowded environments more effectively than, than most people because I know the local signatures that are indicative of these types of collective dynamics. So sometimes I, I exploit the information in that way. But most often what I'm, I mean, I, I, I walk my dog every day and what I'm really fascinated by are patterns in nature. And you know, now I'm getting really interested in plants, you know, you know, plants over certain times because I'm making decisions are, uh, uh, you know, are, are moving through space, are leaving a trajectory of where they've been in the past. And, you know, I think, or oh, jumping spiders, I've started studying jumping spiders, they're amazing animals. So I just, I just fast, I've, I was always a kid that just collected insects and, and animals and looked at animals in nature. And for, for now, I just see these patterns and I see these processes everywhere. Processes about cognition, processes about decision-making. Um, and reflected in, in, in patterns. Um, and that's really what I, I tend to uh, focus on when I'm going for a walk. That's great. Well, thank you, Ian. I, I wish we had the whole day to talk to you because uh, your research is so fascinating. Thank you for- uh, well, It's been, a, it's been a great pleasure and thanks for the invitation. And, and is it, I, will these Q and A's disappear or can I respond to people at a later point um, in writing? Because I would like to respond to the questions, or, or will that disappear? Or can someone make a copy of them? Or how, we can make, how would that we, work? We'll, we will make a copy of them and uh, send them to you because it, we just uh, we di we didn't have as much time as we were. No problem. If if anyone wants to just get in touch with me, you can find my email address easily and just drop me an email. Okay. Thanks a lot. Great. Thank you, Ian. Thank you so much.